So welcome to today's podcast. I'm excited to be speaking with Steve Chandler, the uh, author of over 30 books, including the, the Prosperous Coach and also the founder and lead trainer of the Prosperity School. Steve, it's great to have you with us. Thank you, Robert. I'm really honored to be invited to your program. It's it's um it's really interesting. I was I was rereading your your book, the, the Prosperous Coach, and it's really interesting how sort of the second, third, fourth time round you start to get different layers and, and levels to the book. And I'm just just curious as to you know what what led to the book, but also your thoughts on the book over time. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, it's uh, eight or nine years, I think, since it's been written. And I wrote it with Rich Litvin. Yeah. And he's a, an amazingly powerful, successful coach. But at the time he came into the school, uh, he wasn't. And um, he attended the school, the prosperity school four times. And every time he became more powerful, more grounded. And, and by the third time, uh, he was almost co-teaching it with me. So I, somebody would ask a question and I'd give an answer and then I'd say, Rich, what do you think? And he'd give a better answer. <laughs> I thought, wow, this guy is great. I got to get him out of here. Uh, and then after a while, I said, Rich, let's write a book together that covers everything in the school. And We'll take everything we've learned. You'll take everything you've learned. I'll take everything I've taught and learned. And we'll go back and forth, chapter to chapter. We'll see how it turns out. Because so many people wanted to come to the school but couldn't afford it or didn't mm -hmm. want to travel. We thought, let's just get this out to the world and uh, see if it can make a difference with coaches. So that was the motivation behind the book. We both felt that um, all boats rise. In other words, the better everybody gets in this profession and the more good coaches there are, it's not competition. It's really uh, good for the reputation of the profession. And a lot of newer coaches, when the profession began really trending like it is now, there's so many coaches now, they began to panic like, oh my goodness, there's so many coaches out there now, how will I ever make a living? But the truth is that actually had a positive impact on coaches' ability to make a living because people knew what coaching was. Whereas uh, back when I started the school 14 years ago, People didn't really understand, what do you mean coaching? Is it like psychology or business consulting? And uh, so you almost had to explain what the service was to everybody. But now pretty much everyone knows, all the corporations that I've worked with in the last few years, they all have coaches. They have external coaches. Some of, the, some of them have internal coaching programs. So uh, we were really happy to get that book out and it sold very well. We were really surprised at uh, how many it has sold. I really like that phrase, all boats rise, and this idea that the better we get, the better everybody gets. And I think that for a lot of coaches, especially newer coaches, there is that, that worry that, you know, how will I survive in this market when there are so many of us in that space? That's right. But when you look at the market, there's so many there. There isn't anyone who doesn't really want to change for the better, want to achieve more or want to feel better internally. And uh, in our case, what we taught in the school was both. The better you feel, um, the more grounded you are, the better you know how the mind works, uh, the better you'll be as a coach. So it's, it's the one profession where the health of the healer is vital. Mm. So you can be a brain surgeon and have a terrible personality and 
not get along with people and not even have great integrity in your life. But if you're a great brain surgeon, you're good to go. Same with being a good lawyer. A lot of really great defense attorneys have tremendous personal problems in their lives, but it doesn't affect how well they do in the profession uh, as it would with a coach. Yeah, I think that's something really key there, this idea that the health of the healer matters, especially in the coaching industry and how we look after and protect ourselves and our well-being is, is fundamental, especially I think that within that space of, you know, what's happening in that space is also a reflection of who we are in that space. That's right. That's, that's right. And a lot of coaches don't quite get that. They think if I get the right information on how to coach, that ought to be enough. I don't, um, I'll work on myself later when I have a lot of money, when I have the luxury to do so. But having your own coach while you're coaching and creating your career, I think is really vital. And, and I, I want to sort of go back a bit, I guess, to pre uh, the prosperous coach uh, space and sort of explore what, what sort of led you into the, the, the coaching world and into setting up your school. You know, I, um, I was the last person anyone ever would have thought would be um, coaching somebody else. My life was a total mess right through the age of 35. Um, I had addiction problems and um, really severe addiction. I was lucky to survive that and make it out alive. And that was the turning point for me. That gave me a new chance to create a life, not based on substances and how temporary relief from my anxieties, but it was now based on uh, what can I do that would serve? So I, tr I was in a lot of different professions. I was in the music business for five years, uh, writing songs. Um, I was in journalism. Then I later got into corporate training. I wasn't really coaching. I was um, doing seminars for sales teams. I was a sales trainer and a leadership trainer. So I was going around to different corporations and giving talks. It wasn't until the corporations woke up to coaching and they started to realize that's even more powerful than group training. And uh, they would ask if I could add some coaching to a seminar, uh, stay another day and work with our key people and coach them. And I was so desperate for money back then. Uh, I said, sure, if you'll pay, uh, you, you'll pay me that much. Of course I will. But I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I would sit across <laughs> the table and uh, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. I would just say, so uh, what's going on? And uh, that's all. That was it. That was my script. And then we would go from there and I would see if I could help in any way. And um uh, it started to take off in that direction. I didn't like it at the start. I was nervous. Uh, I was really terrible at acquiring coaching clients. I, I, didn't, uh, I had money fears and money issues. And I had um, social anxiety as far as approaching people, inviting them into a conversation. That was a struggle for me where it whereas it came easier for more confident people. But the more I did it, and the more I was coached, the more exciting it got to see lives change and to really make a difference with another person. I really got, I fell in love with the profession over time. I didn't, I didn't love it at the start. It was a way to make money and that was it. That's really interesting to hear that it was, you know, you fell in love with it over time. And at the beginning, it was about making money. I think a lot of coaches have this sense that they should love it yeah. always. And, uh, and you know, they should have these purely altruistic, uh, good intentions around coaching all of the time. Uh, I'm being generalistic there, but 
yeah. it's really, I guess, refreshing to hear that it took you a while to fall in love with this thing. It really did. It was a little bit like learning a musical instrument um, where at the beginning, I don't think I'm very good. I'm trying to learn the piano and this isn't the right instrument for me. But then staying with it a while, well, it's kind of fun. Uh, I don't mind it so much. And then stay with it, stay on the path. Stay, if you stay on the path with anything, I believe, uh, it start, you, you eventually fall in love with it. And it kind of sneaks up on you like, I can't wait. I've got an a enrollment call. And is this going to be exciting and fun? Whereas before, oh, I've got an enrollment call. I just dread it. I have butterflies. And so it, it's a process over time. So in our school, when we work with new coaches, we let them know that early anxiety and early, early thoughts like this, this doesn't seem to be a fit for me. Um, I worked with, uh, gave a talk to one coaching program. One of their questions to all the new coaches was, write out, what do you love about coaching? Why do you love this profession? And I, I thought, you know, if I had been in that class, <laughs> I would have said, well, okay, I don't know what to write down. Uh, I'll come up with something that makes me look like the other people who love it. But that's not me. I'm struggling. Uh, but it, and I, I know a lot of coaches who are really great now, um, who really had a lot of problems, especially in the area of building their business once they learned how to coach. And I, I think something really um, sort of fundamental in this, this idea that it takes practice and it takes time to build the skills and the, the craft. Often when we see an experienced coach, as a, as a new coach, when you look at an experienced coach, you go, I, I, I wouldn't be there now. Yeah without recognizing the the effort and the time and the practice that it takes uh, to get there. So kind of recognizing that it takes time to to move there, I think so is sort of one of those things we hear often, but we don't always sort of really take in. Yeah, it's really important to know that and to know a lot of new coaches think I'm, I must be doing it wrong. It's not working for me. I talked to a person, they never got back to me. Uh, there must be something I'm, I, I must be. And then they start to personalize it. And they make it mean, mean that that person doesn't want to spend time with me or I'm not worth spending time with. That's the message I would take whenever someone didn't want to work with me, like I'm not worth it. And then I began to give that a meaning like rejection. You know, I got enough rejection in high school. Why would I go into a profession where I revisit my high school days and start getting rejected again? But uh, there's a way to work with it so that it doesn't occur to you that way. You can change how things occur to you. Uh, they're not just inherently frustrating or inherently discouraging. It, if I can see it as part of the path, part of the process, I'm going to fall off my bike. And uh, when I learn to ride a bike, I don't care how many books I've read about riding a bicycle or how many video tutorials. <laughs> here's, how, here's how you keep your balance. Uh, I am going to tip over and, and get up and say, I don't see how other people ride bikes. Uh, they tip over. Uh, there must be something about me and my balance that has this not be the right thing for me to get into. But that's a mistake because uh, it's, that's just a stage in your development. And every profession has it. Uh, doctors go to medical school and spend a long time learning things that they think they're not good at learning. Lawyers go to law school, accountants go to college and get trained. So coaching, if it's to be highly paid, respected, why would it not follow the same path that requires early practice, early stages of your development? And um, like any other good profession. I, th I think part of the, the challenge that sometimes sits with this is there are those 
that will say, hey, come learn how to be a life coach and 200 pounds, dollars an hour in three weeks time. So people get this illusion that I, I can just jump in and do this. And therefore, if I'm not good at it, it means that I'm not good, that I'm bad, not that yeah. it takes, that there is a learning journey that has to happen. With yeah, it. that's right. And if you have a good coach or if you have a good teacher, even if you're peer coaching with someone who's a good coach, if you don't have the money yet to hire a coach, there are plenty of ways to get a peer coach or someone else, and you can trade off sessions. Um, over time, that clears away, that anxiety goes away, and you start to feel a greater skill set developing in you for listening to other people. I think the biggest obstacle of new coaches is they personalize everything. Mm. So um, someone teaching them will say, well, you didn't find out much about that person. And they think, oh, gosh, I'm not a good listener. And they make it part of their permanent identity, character flaw, or a personality defect. And I'm hardwired not to talk to other people. And that's just not true. It's just lack of time spent developing that. And it sort of reminds me of the work of Carol Dweck and the, the growth mindset and how as coaches in learning, we need to really embrace that growth mindset. Uh, I guess right. we need to embrace it for, forever because it's not just when you, you don't learn it and then that's it. It's like there's a continual learning as coaches. Yeah, that's one of the vital things is um, practicing staying open all the time, not feeling like I got it, I have the knowledge, now I'll apply it. Thank goodness the learning period is over. Because the learning period now gets more subtle because now you have to learn another person's belief system. And the way you coach into one belief system would be ineffective coaching into another. So now here I am learning again. If, if you're really good at developing as a coach over time, that growth mindset, learning mindset that Carol Dweck speaks about so well in her book is it called mindset i think i believe so yeah yeah uh yeah that's a beautiful book for coaches because the growth mindset can be developed it's not something you're stuck with uh you can open up to it develop it grow it evolve it and and you're not stuck with uh how where it is when you begin and I think so with, with the early coaches, it's remembering that yeah. because it's so easy to fall into those old thinking patterns uh, around good enough self-worth. Yeah. Uh, and if we can stay in that learning space and that open to learning space, we can go, ah, didn't get it this time. Okay. What do I need to do next time? Like we would do with our, our coaches. It's quite funny that coaches can be so hard on themselves when they would challenge that in, in a coach who they're working with. Yeah, that's right. It's ironic. And, uh, you know, coaches often think, I, I should know this, or um, I'm a coach. I shouldn't be struggling with a relationship in my family. That shouldn't be happening. So there must be something fundamentally wrong with me. And that's not true. We're, we're, we're human, like our clients. And if we stay open to using these challenges to grow, uh, they're not so challenging anymore. We welcome all situations. And I, I, as you were saying that, it, it reminded me of, of when I first read, read your book. And I remember it, uh, in my sort of first reading, I took away this idea that I've got to find these amazing uh, adventures to take my clients on whether that's a physical or a metaphorical adventure uh and you know what what can i think of to to to, to do with them and in my in my last reading before this conversation i sort of found a different kind of quality to the book a, around courage and bravery uh, around uh, commitment and tenacity which it really spoke differently to me. And I just, just wondered around your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think um, 
when I reflect on the book, it's a little heavy handed in a way uh, meant to wake somebody up. You know, you have as much courage as anyone. Don't be afraid to apply it. And you, anyone can learn to make and keep commitments. Be your word to yourself and to your client. And for a lot of people in our society, that's, that's a whole new approach to life. It, it was for me. I was just trying to survive. I was manipulating people and trying to please them and uh, because I wanted something from them. And the idea of pure service, you know, you mentioned wor worthiness. Newer coaches will say, I feel I have a worthiness issue. I don't feel worthy of charging this fee. I don't feel worthy of coaching this person. They're, they're more successful than I am. And um, I would remind them, and I, I had to be reminded by my coach, that the great coaches in sports or in, um, in the arts, in acting, they uh, are not better players players like Tiger Woods golf coach he can't play he can't play the game better than Tiger but he can coach it mm. better than Tiger can coach it's a different skill and so I would have people not worry about worthy am I worthy but worry about am I useful um, transform it into a usefulness issue how can I appear worthy is one inquiry to live in when I try to get a new client. How can I be impressive and make it look like I should be hired? Now, that quest shuts down my curiosity and my listening when I'm with that person. I'm trying to make an impression. And maybe I'll learn about them later after they pay me. But uh, that, that's reversed. That has to be reversed. I have to enter with openness, curiosity, and no concern for um, whether I'm making a good impression. But concern for what can I help this person? That's really the question. And I think that sometimes coaches especially when you're trying to get clients, because I think one of the challenges that we can have is when you have a lot of clients, you can relax into this, okay, can I be of service to the next client? Can I be of service to the next client? When we have few clients, we're kind of going, oh, I need to find my next client. Otherwise yeah. I can't eat. And so we can get a little bit tense and caught up in this striving and pushing where we uh, as you said, we, we make the appearance that we're worthy as opposed to go, can I serve? Yes. Yeah, that happens. And it happened with me. I tried so hard to um, deliver a powerful coaching session when I met somebody and just really ma make a huge difference um, when really what would have worked in retrospect was just to get to know them and have them relax into the relationship so they feel safe and they, they connect with who you're being, not what you're doing or what you're saying. They connect best with non-judgmental inquiry hmm. and with um, relatedness. If you tell me something that's really off and I can relate, yeah, I've had that. Um, that's that's common that's not unique to you they start to relax oh okay and the feeling of connectedness like this person understands me this person cares to find out what's really going on with me and then he he doesn't seem to judge it he seems to say that that's no big deal i mean that's that's something that can be worked on and altered if you if you are really willing to give it time and attention and that's all it is everything changes with a willingness to listen more deeply and that that sort of leans into the work i guess of, of nancy klein and carl rogers that you know, how can i really stay and be with you and listen and not interrupt and 
uh, allow you to come into this space as you uh, and while I hold this space for us to have this dialogue. Yeah. And, and what you mentioned earlier is a big factor there. I might need money to pay my bills, but I don't need this person's money. Um, there's two different things. And if I can remind myself, I don't need to get this client. This, I don't need to have this person become a client of mine. I want to drop all that. And I want to find out if, if we have chemistry and if I can help. And, um, that, and that way it takes the pressure off me. There are 8 billion people. So a lot of times coaches tell me I've run out of people to talk to. <laughs> and I said, really? Uh, so you've been through the 8 billion and uh, you want to go to another planet? Or, uh, so, so nobody's ever run out of people to talk to. And there's never a shortage of people who would really love to have their life change if they could feel self, safe and reassured that they're talking to the person who might be able to do that. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's a really, really good learning, I think, there, that this idea that there isn't a shortage of people that that wouldn't want their life changed. They've just got to find the right person to have that conversation with. And, they, and as coaches, what we're striving to do is to, to reach out and go, am I the right person for you? If so, let's go on the journey. And if not, well, I can move on to the next person, not in a dismissive way, but in a, the, you know, there's 8 billion of us. So let's, let's keep looking till we find the right people. That's right. That's true. And you're, uh, I love that you said not in a dismissive way, because early coaches, including me, if the person didn't hire me, uh, my attitude was, hey, bye, you're dead to me. I have no use for you anymore. Uh, there's no reason for us to uh, be related moving. I've got to move on and get, get somebody who will pay me money. The, uh, in, in our school, what, what we teach is the not yet list. And if I see this profession as a relationship profession, and my job today is to create relationships. And if, if someone is not ready to work with me yet, I'm not going to be disappointed and, and give them a feeling that I failed to sell them something. I want to give them a feeling that that's fine. You're not ready to do this work yet, and, um, or you can't afford it right now. I'm fine with that. I'm glad to have gotten to know you. And um, you, at some point, you, I'll be here. And I'd love to hear how you're doing. I'm glad to get to know you. I'm perfectly okay. This is how I work. I talk to people. And most of them don't end up working with me, but that's okay. That has me get to know people better. And then I put them on a not yet list, not a, not a dead to me list or a, a failure column. And every so often I check back, how are you doing? You were um, buying a new company or you were doing this or you were getting a divorce and we talked and thought about you the other day. And so many of those people over the years have said, you know, I think I'm really ready to work with you. And so by keeping those relationships as relationships that I've created throughout my day, my practice builds over time. But if I dismiss them and I have to start all over again with the next person, it's not a very fulfilling day. Yeah, and, and because coaching is so relational that if we are discarding relationships, we're almost, I'm not quite sure what the language is here, but it's, it's like we're corrupting the thing that we're trying to do. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. So it, then it makes me think about this idea that, you know, as, as coaches, how do we lean into, it's just about connections. It's just about creating relationships. And some of those relationships turn into a, a paying relationship. And some of them just turn into checking in relationships and they may or may turn into paying relationships and that's okay. And, and, and I guess it's about how do we be okay with that? Yeah, I think it's just waking up to the reality of that waking up that's how it's going to be whether you like it or not or whether you you would prefer 
a high percentage of people that you talk to the first time sign up and, and work with you. That may happen at the end of your career or in the middle of your career. You get more referrals who are really ready to go, or you get people coming back to you who worked with you five years ago. Uh, so there isn't so much pressure to sell and enroll if you stay in this practice. It'll start to be referrals and renewals because of the quality of your work. Mm. And the quality of your work over time, for every coach I know who is uh, making high income and really loving it now, over time, referrals and renewals uh, replace running around trying to find new people all day, every day. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that there's something about that... Um, at the beginning, we have to have these conversations because we have to build up that bank of relationships and to not get carried away with what, uh, I guess, salespeople will tell you because there are, there are lots of courses out there for coaches that will tell them, have this conversation in this way and we guarantee that this will happen. So it goes back to that personalization piece where we have it in that way and it doesn't quite work out for us. And we go, well, I've done something wrong as opposed to yes. going, there is a percentage here. And over time you'll get better at those conversations, but you'll also, I guess, get better at having the conversations with the right people that are right for you. Yes, absolutely. And those programs that um, have techniques and scripts, um, they would be, they work for selling a lawnmower or, or selling certain um, items. They work well in that field. But in the field of coaching, they have the opposite effect. Because if I'm trying to manipulate you, my chance of really connecting with you heart to heart is gone. Because... People feel the manip children feel being manipulated. Uh, people don't. People pick up on um, the fact that I'm trying to get trying to get you to do something, and that's a manipulation. I want to change that to I'm trying to find out what you're up against, what you've tried so far, what it means to you to have this change. And uh, how open are you to looking at different ways of seeing life? And I want to find that out. And in the process of finding that out, we can create some really great heart-to-heart -heart relationships where the other person then decides, I don't want this to stop. Uh, I've had two conversations with her or him, and I want to keep going. So what will it take? So then the other person says, here's my minimum program. If you want to take our conversations to a professional level and have the kind of commitment that you have when you commit to a program to have these things change. And then hopefully the other person says, I've already seen some change from talking to you. So I have the experience that this works, that this helps instead of trying to do a leap of faith based on what you're promising. Mm. That, that's, as you were saying that, that, that last part, it sort of reminded me of the, the world of social media now, where a lot of coaches are, are, are in that space and, and they do some great work in that space, but we also have people in that space promising these outcomes without getting to know us first. I just wonder, what, what's your thoughts on how... I guess the industry and, and marketing and, and sales within the, or enrollments within the industry have changed. Well, I think so, there's a place for social media um, for coaches and social media and even marketing uh, has a place if you're doing a group or a school or you have a, a product you've done or you're doing an event, a weekend event, you can't get to know personally if you want a hundred people to show up in a in a 
hallway and do it, do this weekend event with you and another coach, um, you're not going to be able to talk intimately to all 100 people in advance. So there has to be uh, some form of advertising and marketing. Who are we? What's our intention? What's our background? Um, where are the testimonial feedbacks? But for one-on-one -on -one coaching, that doesn't work. That, that is not useful. The relationship has to start. Now, you can start it on social media. Somebody posts something, um, I'm changing jobs, I'm going through a hard time. And a coach private messages them and says, uh, I'm happy to help you out with that. I work with people on that. Um, if you'd like a conversation, no strings attached. I can tell you how I work with people. And so you can, you can, if you move people from the public forum, however you do it, into a, an actual conversation. But without conversations, I've never seen a, a coaching mm -hmm. practice built. Even if someone has a best-selling book, or um, things they think would do it. Uh, high profile, uh, lots of followers on social media. Without that conversation, uh, all of that, to get one-on-one -on -one clients, it, it, you haven't put the, the most important piece in there yet. Yeah, so I, I guess part of that, or part of what I'm hearing or understanding is we can do that mass work but we've got to turn those those conversations into one-on-one -on -one conversations you can't keep it just as a public conversation at some point it's you and I having a conversation either about what's interested you about what I've said or where I've noticed what's going on for you and where we're conversing about that yeah that's it exactly yeah it comes back to the let's get into dialogue and let's get into yes. relationship yeah, and I, I stopped fearing doing that when I realized that people have a longing, especially in our high-tech civilization, a longing for real connection with another person, not just angry uh, tweets back and forth and things like, that. hey, you, you, know, I'm, you know, I like what you said, I hate what you said but a real talk with a real person, there's less and less of that in life. So when I invite that, uh, I don't have to have a great personality or charismatic. If I needed that, I would have been out of this industry in a heartbeat. Uh, I just have to have a desire to listen and to share my own stories where they help you. And I can be awkward. I don't need any kind of special appeal as, as a person, what all I need is a way to have the other person see possibility and invite and find, find a way that they can find an open mind to possibility and then go from there and see if I can help. Hmm, I think there's some really use, useful stuff in there that, that people can really, uh, explore and reflect upon especially as a, as a new coach or if you're feeling a bit stuck in in how you're working to kind of just go back to that basic of how can we have conversations how can we explore how can I stay curious and to allow that to go somewhere as opposed to pushing for something to to happen or take place yeah that's it and and I sort of there's a question that's kind of buzzing around in my head about, so I, I know you from the Prosperous Coach and that's the kind of the, 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 the space that introduced me to you, but I'm aware that you've done over 30 books. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots of other aspects of you. And I'm just, just curious as to, you know, other, other things that you've, you've written about or spoken about that you kind of go ah, that I wish that had that kind of traction or, or people listening to that work as well. Yeah, I, it, it's been, it hasn't been um, as planned out, organized, or as intentional. It's been, um, I didn't write the first, I never thought I could write a book or that anyone would have any interest in it. 
And I did my first one in my late 40s. And I enjoyed it so much. And so many people said, boy, that helped me. Um, I, I got a fire in my head to do another one. I, I thought, I'm going to have two books in the world. And I never thought I could do any. So then I wrote Reinventing Yourself because I had been coached in such a powerful way that I finally saw that I was not stuck with who I thought I was. Um, and his whole point was, who would you like to be? What do you, um, who would, and, and to achieve this, who would you need to be? Where do you want to come from on the inside? You're not stuck with, well, I've never been good at this and i'm just no 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 just that's that's a not very interesting history of your life kind of depressing really when i hear the whole story but what you can be is yours to create and uh, i thought i want the world to know this maybe they won't get it maybe they won't believe it but it did happen to me and i want to tell them how the mind shifts mm. when it sees our true creativity, the, the divine creativity that is in all of us, not just Charles Mingus and Miles Davis and people like that, but in all of us. Uh, I want people to see that. So now I had two books. There wasn't really a feeling, oh, I need to write a book about this, or I, I want to write a book about that. It was just after every book, something started to bubble up in me like, oh, I really, I would really love to write about that. So it's just been kind of chaotic. I, I, I love the idea of it being chaotic. I think sometimes we get too caught up in this idea that we should write a book yeah. in order to, to uh, establish our space within the coaching industry. You know, we need our book, but there's something really... Uh, refreshing to go well I just this was just a burning passion so I wrote about it yeah. and then I had another one yeah. so I wrote about that as opposed to uh, right I needed to do this so I wrote a book about that yeah that's what it was all the way and I I would always fail the I go to motivational courses I would always fail these things about what's your major purpose in life and I would look around the room like uh do we have to have one? Do we still get to live? Can I still live without one? Can I just wake up and serve people and do okay? Oh, no, no, no. You've got to have your North Star. You have to want to change the whole world all by yourself. And uh, the, and people would have these rallies, you know, motivational rallies. you got to dream big. And Don Quixote, uh, to dream the impossible dream. The problem with think, thinking you have to do that to be a successful coach is that can be exciting in one of these uh, motivational rallies that some coaches do. But when you get back home uh, and, the, and the mood fades and, the, and you have your big goal, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be on the Oprah show or something, uh, it looks intimidating. It looks like mm -mm, that's never going to happen. So th this idea that to be a coach, you've got to have this amazing courage and passion and the North Star and uh, a real sense of purpose. This is my purpose. I'm just going to show up and do the best I can and see how much fun this can be and see whether this profession can serve others to the degree that I make a good living financially. And then I'm going to use how I'm doing financially over time, not, not in the beginning, to show me how I've served. It's a reflection of how much service has been delivered. It's not just some greed grab where I talk to people into paying me. People don't pay coaches if they're not being served. It, even if coaches think I've got imposter syndrome, I'm trying to scam this person, you don't make money that way. People, people don't pay for you, and they certainly don't renew with you if they're not being profoundly served and getting a lot for their money. 
And 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 you were saying there about this, you know, this this purpose, this north star that 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 people you know go to a seminar and they they grab it and they stick it on the wall. And go, That's my thing. Because I sometimes think that those north stars can emerge from how you're showing up, yeah. and they can come from what you notice about yourself over time to go, hey, this I'm doing this, and that's the difference I'm making. So in that reflective space we can notice how we're showing up as opposed to pushing it out there we can kind of draw it from inside ourselves yeah you're right you're right it doesn't have and and it even if you have one i'm not against it if you have one but even if you have one uh it doesn't have to be accurate it can start you moving like michael jordan's dream was to play back play baseball he wanted to play baseball. That was his, the sport he loved. But they kept telling him, uh, you know, you're okay at baseball. You're great at basketball. And he's, I am. Oh, man, you're, you're otherworldly. <laughs> I am. I think I'll make that my north. You know, that, that looks even better because people appreciate it. So it's, it, can, it can change as you go. Uh, we have a, a saying in the school, it's not what a goal is, it's what a goal does. So if my big goal is uh, filling me with enthusiasm and getting me into action where I wouldn't have been, uh, then that's fine. Because uh, it's serving me. But my go- my big goals used to intimidate me. I'm going to make $100,000 and I'd put it on my whiteboard and I'd come into work and I'd look at the goal and, uh, and I'd just crash like, oh, that. I have no idea how I'm going to do that. Who am I kidding? I used to have all these who am I kidding goals. <laughs> I like that. Who am I kidding goals? Because they're the ones that, that, that don't scare us into action because sometimes we can go, oh my God, I don't know how I'm going to do that. And it can create action in us. But the ones yeah. that that push us into into despair it's like that that doesn't work that's not that's not motivating for us so how can we have the ones that actually awaken our spirit as opposed to diminish our spirit yeah you're right and and i don't have to i mean creating the impossible is wonderful uh we had a slogan in the school doing the doable it's not as exciting (laughs) We don't jump up on the, our chairs and start yelling about doing the doable, but it relaxes people into, um, I want this to be a, a really respectable set of skills. I want to learn them, and I really want to be of help to my clients and make a good living. Now, that, that's not unreasonable entering any profession to have that be your GPS. That's what I'm headed for. And people get the impression that coaching requires astonishing vision and courage and like we're all going to climb Mount Everest in boxer shorts. And uh, we're going to get in the Guinness Book of Records and get on television for doing it. It's not, it is like every other profession. You can love the path to being really good. And, um, and, and then there's a chance to even be great if you stay on the path, but you, but you don't have to get yourself all worked up. Mm. And I think sometimes we misread those people that are in the Guinness Book of Records or, or are in the shining light. We sometimes think that that was their intention. And often yeah. when you read their work, you find out that they woke up one morning and was like, oh, we're doing this now? That wasn't the intention. The intention was to right. do the work and to explore and to see. And through the exploration, it, people paid attention to it and elevated it to that space. Yeah, that's it. So I, I was going to ask the, a question I often ask people uh, in, in the podcast, you know, what, what's next for you? And there's a bit of me that's going... You might not have a next because you may just go, I'm just going to see what happens. And, but I'm going to leave that question out there and, and see how you sort of you face it. Well, um, what's next for me is um, retirement. 
where I'm going to retire from active coaching and go into um, book writing and giving talks on various subjects. Um, but I, I haven't decided total. So sub- I've got a couple new books started, but I'm go- I want to have what I create and produce be absolutely intuitive and impulsive and not seeing where it goes just for the fun of it. I don't care if it sells a book, but just to play with it. And um, so that's it for me. I'm, I'm going to play around and try to sell some unusual books. Steve, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Likewise, Robert. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.